And now I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, this evening. Gary Brewer, we owe a special thanks to because he was the one who really spearheaded this today's symposium and uh, his time and his generosity in putting this together has been stellar. So thank you, Gary. Uh, our first panelist, Peter Penoyer Architects, architecture winner this year. I'm sure you're all familiar with Peter's work and his firm's exquisite, exquisite work. Peter Penoyer Architects is internationally renowned for its practice inspired by traditional and classical architecture. The firm has built a substantial and varied body of work over the past 27 years and advocates for the re relevance of classical architecture in the contemporary practice. Principal Peter Penoyer established the firm in 1990 and today leads alongside his partners, Jennifer Garakaris, excuse me for mispronouncing your names, Elizabeth Graziolo, Thomas Nugent, and James Taylor, as well as the firm's director of design, Gregory Gilmartin. The diverse projects of Peter Penoyer Architects include the restoration of historic properties, institutional commissions, and private residences worldwide. From the shingle style of New England to the arts and crafts tradition of the Pacific Coast, the firm absorbs the history and the vernacular of an area and remakes it to become its own. Our recipient for education this year as a Ross winner is Thomas Gordon Smith. Thomas's career combined the practice of architecture and teaching. Thomas taught at UCLA, Cy Arch, Yale University, and the University of Illinois Chicago before he was appointed chairman of the School of Architecture at the University of Notre Dame in 1989 to 1998. At Notre Dame, he worked to transform the school into a place where classical architecture would be the foundation of the program. His publications include Classical Architecture, Rule and Invention, Vitruvius on Architecture, and books related to early 19th century American architecture and furniture. He received the Bachelor of Arts in Art and a Master of Architecture from the University of California at Berkeley. He won the Rome Prize in Architecture at the American Academy in Rome for 1979 to 1980. And his facade and architectural designs contributed to the Strada Novissima Venice Biennale exhibition, The Presence of the Past in 1980. John Saladino is our winner for interior design. This is the only the second time an interior designer has won an Arthur Ross Award. John is one of the world's most distinguished and respected architectural and in interior designers. His timeless work continues his philosophy of mixing old with new and appeals to both traditional and modern clients. His full maturity as an artist and a master of scale blends easily with his historic references from the Villa of Mysteries in Pompeii through Palladio and William Kent. His work is always layered with historical knowledge, whether implicit or explicit. He was born in Kansas City, Missouri, graduated from Notre Dame and the Yale School of Art and Architecture. And in 1972, he founded Saladino Group, which has grown into a full service architectural interior design and landscape design firm with a multinational staff of 25. His current projects range from a palace in Kuwait, a garden on a private island in Greece, a 10,000 square foot Palladian residence in Palm Beach, as well as several private residences in Santa Barbara, Seattle, and residential towers with huge public spaces in New York City. John has won numerous interior design and furniture awards and has served as a board member for a number of organizations, including Parsons School of Design, New York School of Interior Design, Save Venice, and the Sir John Soane Museum Foundation in London. He lectures worldwide, appears regularly in books and magazines. He'd been on television. I could go on and on, John. Okay. His book, Style by, Sal Style by Saladino, is probably on everyone's shelves. It was published by Francis Lincoln Limited London in 2000 and by Monticelli Press in New York. In March of 2009, John published his book, Villa, which was his own magnificent act of love, and he rightly called it Villa Dilemma. That book was published also by Francis Lincoln. Our Board of Directors Award is a special award. Again, it's not an award that is given every year, but it's deemed an award specifically 
by the board of directors when we feel that there is someone who is exceptionally worthy of this acknowledgement. Norman Askins is that person this year. In the fall of 1977, Norman Davenport Askins established his practice in Atlanta, Georgia. Now in his 40th year of private practice, Mr. Askins has specialized in a range of services from historic preservation, period residences, vacation cottages, and plantations to innumerable additions to existing homes. Aided by longstanding relationships with builders, artisans, and clients, he has had the opportunity to work throughout the American South. In addition to his substantial body of built work, Norman prides himself in his mentorship of the next generation of traditional architects as evident in his 18 former employees who have started their own successful design studios. This is quite an accomplishment. In fall of 2014, inspired by tradition, the architecture of Norman Davenport Askins was published highlighting his practiced work. The board of directors is honored to give this award to Norman Askins. Our panel moderator tonight, most of you all know Gary, Gary L. Gary L. Brewer is a partner at Robert A. M. Stern Architects. Do they require you to use middle initials? Okay. <laughs> Just wondering if I should add initials in my name. Uh, his responsibilities have included, or perhaps challenges, have included the designs of academic buildings, institutional buildings, and houses. He was project architect for the 1994 Life Magazine Dream House, for which over 3,000 plan sets have been sold, and for the 1998 This Old House Magazine Dream House. His experience also includes custom houses in Seaside, Florida, Westport, Connecticut, Houston, Texas, East Hampton, and the Riverdale section of the Bronx in New York. Gary's work has been published in Architectural Digest, Architectural Record, The New York Times, Life Magazine, This Old House, The Classicist, and more. He has lectured extensively on traditional house design, the history of pattern book houses, and the New York City clubs. He's a fellow emeritus and board member of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art here, and he has led the Institute traditional house design seminars for the American Institute of Building Designers in Florida, Virginia, Delaware, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Gary served on juries for the 2009 Residential Architects Design Awards Program, the 2011 Schutze Awards in Atlanta, the 2011 John Staub Awards in Texas, and the 2011 AIA New Jersey Design Awards. As I said, Gary is the one who we can thank particularly for spearheading the vision for today's program. Please, I welcome you all to the podium. Today we are marking the 36th year of the Arthur Ross Awards, which recognize a lifetime of excellence in architecture and the allied arts and also the inaugural award for the emerging excellence in the classical tradition. As these two awards bookend the traje trajectory of a professional design career, it seems appropriate today to take the opportunity to sit with the laureates and find out how they began their careers. Um, but before we go into the questions, I'd like to thank Clay Hales uh, from our office and fellows board member, and Catherine Hansen, uh, associate from our office, who <clears throat> with me, we did an extensive amount of research on all of the winners, especially their early life. Um, and as our president might say, we found huge findings, um, but we're only going to share professional stories. Um, otherwise, Bunny Williams <laughs> and Suzanne uh, Santry would have to just uh, describe it as fake news. So, <laughs> so um, I'd like to start with John. Um, after graduating from Notre Dame and Yale in the mid-60s, you worked for a few years alongside Italian architect uh, Piero Sertogo in Rome. And we found out that Piero started his career as an intern for Walter Gropius, the founder of the Bauhaus. <clears throat> After working for a few years in Rome, you came back to New York and went out on your own in 1972. How did working with Sartogo and your Rome experience influenced your design aesthetic, and what caused you to take the leap and go out on your own? Well, first of all, um, I feel I'm in a safe place here. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen so many distinguished looking people 
and that we all drink from the well of classicism, which luckily is bottomless. So Piero Sartogo was teaching at the University of Virginia. My brother was there getting a degree in uh, the history of architecture, and he had a cast on his leg. And I insulted him repeatedly about his breakaway cast to get sympathy. <coughs> and he came to New York, and we got along very well, and he offered me a job in Rome. So for two years, I was transported to a place that I had always yearned for. And I had been to Rome before, but to live there, to fall in love with the scale of buildings, I was released from the Protestant holding back. So the theatricality of Roman buildings uh, was huge influence on my work, and so was. Um, I fell in love with the corroded surface. So to see the ruins of a building left alone, buildings that were partially Etruscan, Roman, medieval, Baroque, and the respect that the Italians extended to those buildings really did leave a lasting impression on me. So I brought that back home and I was forever grateful for the two years I had there. Great. Um, so Thomas, um, John graduated from Notre Dame in 1960, uh, nearly 30 years before you became the head of the School of Architecture uh, in 1989. Uh, your arrival at Notre Dame became a turning point for the school, transforming it into a place where classical architecture would be the foundation of a pedagogical um, program. Uh, Thomas, you have said that while you were studying in Berkeley, uh, you got your guidance not necessarily from your professors, but more so from architectural historians and from examining classical buildings. Uh, what was it like to be an architecture student interested in classical design in the 1970s? Well, it was a great opportunity, uh, and uh, actually there were, you know, quite a few architects there, uh, you know, in the, in the school. Uh, who were extremely uh, positive in that sense as well. Uh, but in any case, you're right. Uh, in that period of time, uh, one really had to kind of uh, make a uh, opportunity to uh, say, this is what I want to do. And uh, it was kind of a scary thing on the part of most of our teachers uh, because uh, it just seemed like it was completely out of, uh, you know, the absence situation. Uh, but, uh, you know, we really, the benefit of that over a long period of time afterward uh, was not only myself, but other people who had a similar idea of bringing classicism uh, basically uh, into work and uh, then a broader and broader situation, uh, including not only our, our uh, students, uh, but then over that uh, there's been really a tremendous uh, numbers. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Norman, um, you're originally from Birmingham, Alabama, and you studied at the Georgia um, Institute of Technology and the University of Virginia before working for four years as an architect and architectural historian at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Uh, Colonial Williamsburg, as you know, is a combination of classical architecture and urbanism, partly restored and partly reimagined and a wonderful example of southern regional traditions in architecture. How did this experience and your background um, help shape your career? Oh my gosh, it was an unbelievable uh, experience for me because I was able to, well, the guy that was head of the uh, architectural history part of it was a guy named Paul Buchanan, and he, he became kind of my mentor. And his philosophy was not to tell you everything, but make you figure it out on your own, and uh, so uh, that is exactly how I approached my employees, was I'm not gonna tell you the, the tricks, you have to figure them out. So it was an amazing thing, I learned how to measure buildings and uh, visit many, many old buildings and uh, draw them, and once you measure a building and draw it, you understand architecture way better than reading in it in about it in books or seeing pictures, it, it's a whole different animal. So I, that is, uh, 
uh, translated for me into my, uh, helped me with my entire career is, is that experience of really hands-on examination of things. <clears throat> Peter, um, you came into the world of architecture and design right as architecture was starting to shift. Postmodernism emerged in the 1960s but flourished in the 1980s right after you received um, your Masters of Architecture from Columbia in 1984. Who were the people that had a substantial effect on you during the postmodern era, and what led you from postmodernism directly into, say, a more literate traditionalism? Uh, well, as you know, um, I studied with uh, Bob, who's here tonight, uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, Bob had a terrific undergraduate uh, junior studio, we called it, uh, which was actually rated the most difficult course in the entire book of the whole university. So that was good training. The postmodernism um, was a great chance to begin to think about design, um, but it was a kit of parts that was very limited. The moldings were either half rounds, quarter rounds, or square. Um, it was it was a and the column was uh, a Schwerd uh, model 101 with no cap. Uh, instead, there would be a three quarter inch reveal, which is interesting. So, <laughs> we built from there, and um, I think everyone in Bob's office was always looking to uh, history and to, to grow. So there, this was not a place where one stood still. And it was that interest and dedication to history and looking and studying that really was the basis for, for growth. And, and what do you think of as your, say, first literate traditional project? Uh, well, there is a lobby, believe it or not, on 14th Street and Fifth Avenue that's still there. And even though it's postmodernist, it has columns and it has a cornice, and um, it's uh, it's been painted black, which is rather strange. But uh, you know, it looks a little bit more like the entrance to a nightclub now, but it has persisted. Well, having uh, studied uh, around the same time as you, I always thought of postmodernism as the gateway gateway drug to classicism. So, John, uh, back to you. Your practice has been founded on a combination of your interests, um, architecture, interiors, gardens, and history. Um, when you started your practice in 1972, uh, architecture was not exactly at a high point with buildings completed that year like 55 uh, Water Street or One Penn Plaza. What was it like to be exploring the classical tradition in your designs at a time when the use of glass, steel, and reinforced concrete inside and out reigned supreme and what challenges did you face? Well, I always uh, was somewhat schizophrenic in that I would mix the present with the past. And people had never seen, for instance, platforms with leather mattresses, but yet the walls were painted in imitation of the cathedral at Orvieto in taupe, in high gloss, and in matte finish. And there was a beginning of all the influences of Rome. I did an apartment on East End Avenue and had um, photographs of Constantine, the fragments from the Campidoglio, uh, blown up eight feet high. So when you got off the elevator, you were immediately theatrically exploded into this uh, trompe l'oeil <laughs> space. So the, the mixing allowed me, I think, to not offend the international glass and steel people. And um, <laughs> anyway, I was thinking about uh, how often I would say, why does Richard Meyer not live in his own house? Why does he live in a shingle house in the Hamptons? And there was always that question that people just naturally uh, are, are comfortable with the scale of the things touched by man, where you feel immediately at, at ease. And sometimes in an all glass house, you feel not at ease. So that is what helped me in my journey. Norman, um, as John was facing the tyranny of the glass box at the beginning of his practice, 
Uh, architectural style in the American South was perhaps in a different place. Their traditional residential design continued throughout the early, early 20th century with architects like Neil Reed, A. Hayes Town, and Philip Schutze, among others. How has the history of architectural style in the South affected your thinking of the designs of houses, interiors, and gardens? Well, I, I think um, uh, Georgia and the South was very fortunate to have a lot of really great classical architects. And, you know, Southerners love columns. So, so uh, you know, it, it kind of petered out a little bit, you know, in, the, in that horrible era in the 60s, 70s. But they really never lost uh, their feel for, you know, classicism and, and intimacy and all the things that make for great houses. So I was able to just pick up where others had, from the 20s had left off and kind of uh, uh, re, I, I reinvented the 1920s houses, I guess, in the South and made them more livable for the days, uh, you know, the way people live today and added all the extra rooms that people need. And, you know, it, so it was, it was really a, a, it was fantastic for me to, to be, to have that, uh, when there was no other, con I had no competition, actually, in, this, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there was almost nobody there doing traditional stuff, so I was very fortunate, and I got to, you know, uh, base, and I based most of my house on, you know, the 20s house, which was really uh, some of those brilliant houses in, in, the, in, in America, I think. Absolutely. Great moment. Thomas. Uh, looking to your background uh, in Berkeley and the Bay Area, in the early 20th century, architects such as Willis Polk, Julia Morgan, and Bernard Maybeck were producing inventive work by reinterpreting history and tradition. Uh, as the author of Classical Architecture, Rule, and Invention, how does one decide when to break the rules or, and when to invent? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, you know, as every time we approach a new project, uh, we're seeing it diff differently. Uh, and uh, also, there's also this tremendous opportunity, especially as time was developing uh, in this uh, period before we're talking about, uh, in terms of really uh, creating architecture, which is actually, uh, you know, bringing in so many things from so many areas, which was very popular at the time, but also it could be classical uh, in that sense. And uh, so in any case, that, that, and certainly I wasn't, you know, alone in this by any means, there was a great, great uh, opening uh, during that period of time of uh, many of us, uh, you know, trying to figure out, well, how do, how do we deal with this uh, with the materials that we have uh, available, uh, the the, the amounts of, uh, you know, material that was necessary, but also uh, what was out there for us to be able to use and to do clever, clear, uh, clever kind of situations. Uh, so I certainly, you know, we, we have others here too, uh, including yourself, who are working with these things and really developing, uh, but also being uh, aware of the, uh, the need to, to build, to build, but also to make it within the uh, opportunities that were available. Uh, John, um, it's often said that the best architects think like interior designers, and the best interior designers think like architects, say, illustrated in the work of Stanford White or Dorothy Draper. Uh, what do you think the relationship is and should be between interior design and architecture? Well, I've always approached the work by starting off with what the clients want. I ask them to bring their box of repressed dreams with them. <laughs> and then we sort through that with the budget. And then, <laughs> and finally what happens is, I do believe all of us here do this, you start with the larger idea the scale of the house, how it fits into the landscape, does it face north, um, how to make the approach more elegant, more secretive, or grander, and then you go into the interior. So you keep going from the general to the particular, and then you go back again. And finally, I think after the clients have told you everything that they possibly want, 
you go into your studio and close the door so that you can now find a reality better than the one they left you with. So, plus the building department and all the other people. <laughs> I was noticing tonight that the electrical wall outlets are against code. They're in the carpet here. <laughs> <laughs> They're grandfathered and, in. And so, my colleagues here all, all have scar tissue from what we do. And in America, we have no really person in the government who's in charge of the arts, like they do in France and Italy. We have no bella arte, no comune. So I, I think we all here fight all the time uh, for respect. And uh, developers now have more respect than we do. You know, they, they are the big money guys, and they say, so I want this, and I want that, and so we're left victims of America's own kind of embracing democracy, and it's very difficult when you're an elitist to live here. So, Peter, um, you had worked for the devil early in your career. Um, <laughs> And you spoke about um, learning from Stern and learning from your uh, uh, classmates or colleagues in the office. And now you're in a position, maybe 20 years later, where you're acting, say, as the mentor for uh, the younger people in your office. Could you talk a little bit about the difference, say, between studying architecture um, in a school as opposed to learning it um, at the elbow of somebody uh, like yourself? I'm actually not sure there's that much difference. I mean, you attack a problem, you draw, you sketch, you resolve it, you debate. Um, you do have the client, the challenge, right, the client. And we tell the client, as you call them, repressed memories. I think that's a good thing, or repressed desires, dreams. Um, we call them the list of you know goals. And I tell even couples, you, you will have separate goals and as long as they're not irreconcilable you know I don't want to cause a problem but you take all of that the same way you would in architecture school when you have a problem you have a program um, and the difference in an office is that you have um, at least in my office such a variety of talents and so there isn't really a consistent model for an employee in my office we have one person who just uh, knows how to use his computer for email and nothing else <laughs> um, and he draws using strange paper, he has strange uh, inks, and uh, you know, it's not that strange, but unexpected. Um, and then we have someone who uh, tries to put this head thing on me so I can see a VR. And, and it makes me feel like, you know, I was stoned in the 70s, I don't like it. <laughs> so it's a variety of tools, and that's the challenging thing, but it makes it more exciting. Well, I, I just want to say, the the most uh, revealing thing, I'm, I'm in the penumbra of my life, I'm almost 78, so what I find is a huge difference is the young architects in my firm are all directed towards that machine. And I'll say to them, well, we have all the columns in the office numbered from one to, they're 10 feet high. And I have yardsticks everywhere. And I say, get out the yardstick and show me how big is the entablature with the yardstick. Uh, and they get very uncomfortable with that because I'm asking them to participate as a human being. And I say, turn up, stand up, turn your back on the computer and go over to the column and show me how high you think that room should be. And what is the proportion? Is it three to five? And so that has been very frustrating for them because most of them can't draw anymore either. So I have to, when we're doing these large towers, 52 stories, and I'm 
working on the design of the interior of the swimming pool, the whole facade of the building, the glass, the building department. And these young men in my office, and two women, they have huge mechanical knowledge. But that's not the end, I keep telling them. What is the end? And I said, are you embarrassed to say that we want to make something beautiful, that it moves you emotionally? I said, I don't care about that little, I said, low IQ person that's going to come through here with his rules. I said, the thresholds will, will get done. So that's what I find is they've had their imaginations stifled the young people. That's why we keep drawing in my office and we only design with a pencil. Yeah. We do not start on the keyboard ever. Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, Norman, um, so, uh, so the Arthur Ross Award is maybe a lifetime achievement award, um, but here we have the first uh, award that we're giving to Emily for somebody who's just starting their career. Um, sort of looking back on uh, what you've done over um, the span of your professional life, is there something that you might recommend or a bit of advice that you might give somebody just starting a career in architecture and design? Oh gosh, lots of, uh, lots of things. First of all, you gotta have a great library and uh, that's what I've finally gotten put together after all these years. And I, f I feel like it's so important that you work with craftspeople one-to-one, -one. you get to know them, know their name, because after all, they're the ones that are going to make you look good. And I, I think, and I, we approach every project in my office as a team approach. I, I like landscape architects, I like interior designers or decorators. I like uh, the client, the whole, we, we create a little team and we uh, work things out together and then it, it always gets better and better and better the more teamwork you have, in my opinion. But I, I particularly I'm so proud today that we have so many more craft. When I started out, there were no craftspeople around much. I mean, it was just, it was dead because of modernism. But over the past 40 years, now we have great, we have incredible carvers, we have, um, you know, blacksmiths, we have uh, a, a beautiful millwork companies, we have everything. And I promoted a lot of them, and I feel like um, I'm sort of responsible for some of these these companies that have now do beautiful work, not only for me, but for everybody in town. And I'm, I, I love that I think craftsmanship is the whole deal, you know. And at first it was so difficult, now it's much yep. easier. A client of mine uh, came back a few years ago and he went to a lecture that Bob Stern was giving in their town and his nephew uh, was just applying to architecture school. So at the end of the lecture, um, the young man went up to Bob to ask the exact same question and my client in one of the meetings said Bob's answer to him was wear a tie <laughs> which is another way to succeed uh, as well so um, on that note um, I'd like to open up uh, the to the audience um, questions that you might have uh, for any, any of the panelists Shirley anyone Mark Ferguson, do you have a question? <laughs> I know his name. Let's talk about rules and invention. Is this turned on? Yes. Okay, rules and invention, because that's, it's how you do things with the classical language. It's a very malleable thing. It feels at its foundation, kind of static. It's always there. The parts are always the same, but it's how you put them together that sort of separates you know, the make something good and makes makes things beautiful and maybe you could just talk about how that um, drives your work. I mean, I personally think that it's it's a sort of personal vision and it's something that's developed over a lifetime, but I'm curious, you know, to hear from all of you. Yeah, Norman. Well, of course, the challenge in any architecture is trying to work in all that junk you've got to you know, work with like structure and HVAC, and I've always been interested in working that out as best I can, you know, so it's in, as innocuous as possible. And then you have all the codes that are getting more and more ridiculous. So uh, you have to figure all that out at the very beginning. I mean, you can't just do something because it's not, uh, you can't design something because you've got to make it work and it's got to look great. 
And so it's a constant challenge, and, and it gets worse and worse, I think, and budgets get worse and worse, but you try to make the, something the best it can possibly be, and, and I, I always say in my office, lie, cheat, and steal, you know, to get it to work where it looks the best it can possibly, no matter what you have to do, make it look as good as it can. It's always a challenge. And you have the same challenge. Well, uh, Edward Lutchen said that the practice of classical architecture was a great game and it had rules but you could move the chess pieces where you wanted and I think that is to be taken seriously. You can be very inventive within the framework of classicism. And so I think you have to be inventive. I think the rules don't get you very far when you're confronted with a design problem and I think innovation may be a better word than invention. I think of invention is a Frank Gehry building. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's all there and every time I look at a building that I've thought about as being following the rules, the university club, let's say, I noticed two weeks ago that there were three doors on the inside of the card room, which is symmetrical, but then I stepped through and discovered one of them disappeared and there were two. He shifted the axis 20 inches. So even in a building that's that disciplined, there are all sorts of innovations going on. And I guess maybe to end the conversation and to talk about invention, uh, Thomas, um, your early work was uh, very postmodern, um, um, combining postmodernism with classicism, and your later work sort of moved more into uh, literate classicism. Um, how do you, do you ever look back at your earlier work and feel that you were so free to do whatever you wanted um, and that maybe moving into more traditional work, um, knowing all the rules, um, somehow uh, makes it more difficult to have that sort of uh, youth um, or freedom. Well, I would say, like, probably for many people uh, who are serious, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, who are curious about this, uh, it's going to be something that is, is very big question marks. And, uh, and also, uh, there are a lot of materials uh, for a variety of different uh, books and so forth, going way back to antiquity as well as uh, more, much more recently, uh, where these things become very confusing uh, for a person who's starting to be involved because why, what do I choose? Uh, but then as one has more time to uh, develop this kind of idea of what can I choose and realize that you don't have to do everything or so forth, uh, that this is very, very positive and that it becomes more and more and more uh, something that as one is developing, and of course you do a lot of reading and talking to teachers and, and other people who are very well uh, understanding this, uh, that you really begin to get a sense of what is appropriate uh, in terms of using these elements, uh, but and where uh, are things available, uh, but also not only available, but then appropriate at this place and another. Uh, and so I think that that's, I hope that's helpful, but uh, that it's, it's an aspect of, excuse me, of, um, you know, needing able to look, decide, well, no, this is something out there as a classical element, but I, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it doesn't mean that we need to use all of this stuff, yeah. I guess, is one point. Well, that's a, that's a good answer to end on, um, and your point about appropriateness. So I'd like to thank uh, all of the Arthur Ross Award winners um, uh, on the panel and who spoke earlier. And I'd like to thank everybody for uh, coming as well. And we hope to see many of you at tomorrow's event at the University Club. Thank you. Thank you.